Thank you very much, sir. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you, Mr. Zenheimer, and thank you to all the members of CARP for the incredible honor. I don't know why anyone would pass up an honor to speak with so many uh, active uh, voting members of our society who care deeply about uh, making this community and this country a better place. So I would never turn down such an opportunity. Um, and thank you again for the, for the immense honor. I get two chances to speak to you. I want to start off by just acknowledging uh, Mr. Zenheimer's great work, CARP's great work, your advocacy, your speaking uh, with a powerful voice for, for people who sometimes get ignored and, and seniors, particularly in long-term care, uh, often don't have a voice, which is ironic given seniors in general are very active and participate in voting that uh, seniors would be ignored in long-term care is, is a travesty. So I'm honored uh, to be able to talk with a group that is so engaged. I wanna also just take a moment to reflect on how COVID-19 has really devastated our country and the world in a lot of ways. And it's, it's hit people in so many different ways. Directly, we all know people who've lost their jobs or even their businesses as a result of this pandemic. We also know that it has impacted families, children going to school, seniors, people living with disabilities. But what I believe, I feel you might agree with me, is the most heartbreaking part of this, of this pandemic is how COVID-19 has impacted seniors living in long-term care, how seniors living in long-term care have borne the brunt of this pandemic. It, it is just, uh, it, is a, it is a shame that that's happened. Um, I, I have to say though, in, in all of this, the, the difficulties that we're going through, I've been really proud of, of Canadians coming together and caring for one another, the response that Canadians have shown. We've shown that in hard times, we take care of each other. But the pandemic has also shown that when, when governments don't make the right decisions, there is a cost of government neglect and inaction. Existing problems and crises have been made worse because of that neglect and that inaction. We saw that the, the government's response was not adequate. And so our goal has been throughout this pandemic to fight for people and to fight to make a difference in the lives of people. We see millions of Canadians lose their jobs. Many have not been able to return to work. Many simply can't. When the pandemic hit, we knew that this would be a serious issue. And we put the question, I put the question directly to Justin Trudeau. His initial response was just to make it easier to access EI by waiving one of the week of requirements in terms of application. We said that wouldn't be good enough. So we fought to make sure people got the help they needed, direct supports. It was introduced at $1,000. We doubled that amount to $2,000, which for nearly 8 million Canadians was the difference between putting food on the table and paying the bills and not being able to do so. Students were left out and we fought for them to get direct help to students and were successful to get that help. He left out seniors like many of you, and we fought for you to bring in supports for seniors. This is something we committed to. He, the Liberals decided to only go with a one-time payment only, which we think is inadequate, uh, and we're going to continue to raise awareness of that. The Prime Minister left out people living with disabilities. We fought for them, and we, got, uh, we were able to obtain some supports for seniors, uh, for people living with disabilities. And he refused to provide paid sick leave, which experts say is one of the most important tools, not only to help seniors in long-term care, but to help workers not transmit the illness, as workplaces have been seen to be one of the larger, larging, uh, largest causes or places of transmission. So we were able to fight to establish the first of its kind paid sick leave at the federal level in our country's history. And a number of times, Justin Trudeau tried to cut the help that that people received and we were able to push back and keep the fight going or keep the support going. Uh, I'm proud to say that with the, the, the biggest, I, I feel, impact that we've seen being seniors in long-term care, we announced our plan to offer a care guarantee, a guarantee for seniors to receive the best care possible. We know that uh, most of the lives lost in this pandemic were seniors in long-term care. We believe deeply that seniors deserve to be cared with for, with dignity. Canadians were shocked and, and stared in horror as the army was, was called in to long-term care homes. And the report outlined some very horrible, uh, appalling conditions. And we know that this problem 
is can be attributed to cuts brought in to healthcare from conservative and liberal governments that have absolutely starved our healthcare system of funding. But we know specifically there needs to be more funding for long-term care. And there also needs to be standards of care. But one thing has been very clear. The evidence is overwhelming that for-profit has made things worse for seniors, has made the care for seniors worse. So profit should have no place in our healthcare system, but certainly no place in the care of our seniors. Some of the long-term care providers, as you know, received public help from the government but ended up paying out millions of dollars in dividends and cut the help that seniors needed in the most crucial and critical times. This is completely wrong. So our plan is to remove profit from long-term care, starting with Rivera, which is owned by the, uh, a federal agency. The federal government has complete ability to make that public. We want Rivera to no longer provide for-profit care. As a second largest provider in the country, this would dramatically improve the care that seniors receive many, many people receive. Uh, we want to uh, get fix the overall broken long-term care system. And to do that, we need commitments to seniors that they are gonna receive safe, dignified, respectful care, both at home uh, for home care, as well as in care homes. We want families to be rest assured that they are, their loved ones will be cared for, uh, that there's inspections, that there's appropriate levels of care and staff ratios. And we want a commitment to workers that they know that they're gonna get a, a good wage with benefits, safe and secure jobs, because, because we know that the quality of work is directly related to the quality of care. If there's inadequate hours, inadequate staffing levels, if workers don't earn enough to work in one home, it directly impacts seniors. Uh, our plan is to work collaboratively, collaboratively with patients, caregivers, and provincial and territorial governments to develop national care standards. We absolutely believe we need to learn from this pandemic what worked and what didn't work, and what are the best practices and gather those together to establish what those best practices are. We need to ensure that there's accountability mechanisms. We want to make sure that the standards and the quality of care are tied and backed by stable funding. We want to invest an additional $5 billion in long-term care systems across the country and make sure that our funding is also tied to the principles behind the Canada Health Act. We know that seniors deserve this. Uh, the cost of inaction is too great. This is a commitment and an investment we need to make. We've also uh, talked about how uh, we look at uh, long-term care funding compared to other countries, and we are doing far worse than uh, our, our colleague countries or countries we can compare to, our funding for long-term care falls far too short. Uh, there's a number of other issues that we are dealing with and I wanna to touch quickly on vaccination. Vaccination was seen as this, this light at the end of the tunnel, this opportunity of hope when people were feeling so worried and so afraid. This was that moment when people thought, if we get vaccinated, we get the vaccine, we will get through this but Canada is falling behind, falling dangerously behind other countries in our vaccination efforts. We see the United States and United Kingdom are vaccinating hundreds of thousands of people at uh, every day. And uh, despite their own challenges, they're, they're exceeding their delivery in a way that we, we cannot uh, be falling behind. Uh, we're seeing very uh, serious concerns that are starting to erode public trust and confidence in the vaccine procurement and delivery. So we need to see more transparency from the government providing us details around what was negotiated, what the contracts were. The premiers are requesting the details of the contract. We agree. We need to make sure that the vaccine is produced locally. This is vital. If we cannot produce the vaccine locally, we will always be at the whims of international logistics and international production, which will mean Canadians do not get the vaccine supply that we need. We need a, a successful mass national vaccination campaign and enlisting everyone and anyone who's able to vaccinate or to provide the vaccines to be a part of this effort. We, we know that uh, there has been some finger pointing, but the prime minister, the, the federal leader is in the best position to provide leadership to ensure provinces and territories can all be on the same page to deliver the vaccine. 
Uh, we need to have confidence restored in the vaccine delivery and procurement, and we need to see some some strong initiatives and strong steps to achieve that. Uh, while we are right now focused in on the on the pandemic, long term care, and vaccines, there are still a number of things we need to work on in addition to that. And so I want you to know we are going to continue to focus in on expanding our healthcare system to cover people from head to toe, and that includes pharmacare, which we know has become even more of an issue as workers lost their jobs, they lost their benefits, and even more Canadians can't afford the medication. We're the only country in the world that provides universal health care that doesn't provide medication coverage. We know that this would be an investment that would save all levels of government money. It would be a proactive way to ensure people who are sick are able to either cure their illness or maintain their health so that it would cost our healthcare system less in the long run. We also know that dental care was always envisioned to be a part of our healthcare system, but you could go into a, a hospital or go to a doctor and treat a complicated a heart issue, a surgery for your knee, but if your teeth are, 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 are in need of care, that is not available, and it simply makes no sense. We also want to increase income supports. We know that for a lot of seniors, uh, they simply don't have enough income to be able to live with dignity as they age. Uh, so we want to, uh, the Liberals have still not fulfilled their promise to increase OAS to people over 75. We believe it should never have been to just people over 75. It should be, uh, as OAS starts, it should be increased. We know that the amount of OAS is not enough for people to live with dignity and needs to be increased. I, I refuse to accept that it is okay that any senior in this country lives in poverty and new Democrats are going to propose something concrete to fix this. We will have a, a plan around lifting the amount of supports that lifts seniors out of poverty and provides them with enough to live with dignity. And a lot of questions, very fair questions are coming forward around how we're going to pay for all of this. This is very costly. And I understand it's very important to be prudent about how we spend our resources. And our budget right now looks very troubling to a lot of people. And I, and I understand that. Uh, what we've seen, though, in this, in this crisis is that working families have struggled, small businesses have struggled, but some of the wealthiest in our country, the wealthiest billionaires, 44 Canadians that are the wealthiest billionaires, have increased their wealth by a cumulative of over $62 billion and counting, billion dollars and counting. We know that some of the wealthiest country companies in the world have made massive profits in this pandemic, and many of them pay no taxes, virtually no taxes in Canada. I'm thinking about the Amazon, and Netflix, Google, and Facebook, which make profit here in Canada, but don't pay taxes here. We know that tax loopholes mean that companies that make profit in Canada can take that profit and hide it offshore and shield their profits from ever paying their fair share in Canada. This is a system that was designed by the parties of Justin Trudeau and Aaron O'Toole, and we think they're incredibly unfair. So we believe that those who have made billions off of this crisis should also contribute more. Much like we did in the wartime, there was a profiteering tax, and it wasn't that some companies purposely profiteered, but if you were in the right place at the right time and your profits expanded tremendously, then you have a responsibility to contribute back more. If you've made money off of this pandemic, then you should have a responsibility to contribute more. And we're talking about the large corporate grocery stores, the large and wealthy, uh, wealthiest companies that have made massive profits. Amazon has increased their wealth uh, astronomically. So there should be a pandemic profiteering tax to ask those who have the ability to contribute a bit more. We still believe that uh, on fortunes of, of over $20 million, the top of the 1% should be contributing a little bit more. And, and we can do so. We are the only party that has put this idea forward and, and the Liberals voted against it, the Conservatives voted against it, and the Bloc voted against it. We also know that we've got an opportunity to build back. Once we, it's hard to imagine, but once we get through this pandemic, there will be an opportunity to build back. But when we do so, we can't go back to some things that weren't working. We've got to change things that weren't working, and we have to build back better. And building back better means that we've got to build back better for everyone. We can't go back to a healthcare system that didn't cover everyone and where making money was more important than caring for our loved ones. We can't go back to a time when people who are or sick could not stay at home. And, and, and we have to ensure that people can stay home when they're sick, that there is paid sick leave. 
and, and we can't go back to a time when people who didn't have enough work or enough money were left to figure it out on their own. We need to provide the right supports. One of the le lessons we've learned from this pandemic is that we are better and we are stronger when we take care of each other. So my commitment to you, to Canadians, is that New Democrats will keep on fighting for you. Just as we have done every day of this pandemic, we are going to continue to fight for you and your families. Because you elected New Democrats and because they were there for you, we were able to provide the supports that you and your families need. We won't stop fighting for your families, for your health, and for a brighter future. We will keep on making sure that Parliament works for you. So thank you so much. Uh, C'était vraiment un grand plaisir d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui. On va continuer de se battre pour vous. Thank you so much, and I'm ready for any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Singh, for, for joining us this morning, this afternoon. And, and I want to apologize to my colleagues. I, I jumped ahead in the agenda. I got excited when I saw you came on and I went right to you. So I do apologize. I did step off of our, our, our plan. So I'm gonna ask that you, you hang on and Mr. Bill Van Gorder, the Chief Policy Officer at CARP has the focus for our 2021 advocacy. And I think uh, there'll be a lot of uh, common ground. And Mr. Van Gorder, if you could uh, lead us in, in your presentation and then Mr. Singh will take questions for the entire gang. Uh, on, on these important issues. That's all right with everyone. Thank you, sir. This is Bill Van Gorder, Chief Policy Officer at CARP. All right. Thank you, Anthony. You can hear me all right? Yes, sir. Thank you very much and welcome to all of you across the country, almost 600 people. Last time I uh, looked and good to be able to talk to the entire country. This afternoon, I'm going to uh, review some of CARP's advocacy priorities for 2021. Uh, your chapter leadership across the country will be receiving all of this in much uh, greater detail. And of course, uh, priorities do change as new topics and circumstances come up. So uh, we will remain flexible to respond in as many areas we can. And of course, as always, our local chapters uh, look to local issues and uh, focus on them as, as appropriate. The national priorities at this time for CARP for next year will include, of course, long-term care, uh, home and community care, financial security, older adult fitness, and a watching br brief on a number of other uh, issues. But to begin with uh, long-term care, uh, we can't uh, ignore 80% of all the COVID deaths uh, uh, were linked to institutional care uh, last year. Like you, CARP leadership has been shocked by that. Uh, but in, in spite of the uh, terrible occurrences in long-term care, we will also be focusing on what we see as a continuum of long-term care. Long-term care is not just facilities. Long-term care begins when, as we get older, we begin to need some extra help uh, to uh, live well, either for our health or our home and where we are. And it's a continuum that moves through uh, needing more medical services, supports in our homes, in our community, through the stages of increased care, which would move through perhaps long-term care uh, facilities and eventually into uh, hospital uh, care. So CARP's progression is going to be looking at the entire process, including long-term care facilities, but with an emphasis on the care that older Canadians require in their own homes and their communities. But before we get to home and community care, I, we do want to talk a little bit about long-term care. Canada spends 1.3% of its gross national product on long-term care. 37 other OECD countries, countries like the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, send, spend 3%. That's twice as much as Canada spends. Long-term care has to be completely built from the ground up. Governments have to realize that large facilities that warehouse our seniors are not the way we want to treat our loved ones. So CARP will engage the federal and provincial and territorial governments to challenge them to improve and standardize long-term care. 
Harper asked the federal government to play a greater role in setting the tone for the long-term care system. We don't accept the fact that for some historic reason and arguing with the provinces, they have to stand back or play ping pong with our older adults. Both must come to the table equally and work, and, and work to the same kind of goals. Now, in many prov provinces, uh, uh, not for uh, profit long-term care uh, is uh, at, at, at fault. What we're finding and what we're seeing is uh, the problems that aren't uh, between for-profit and not for profit. It's not who runs it, but how it's run. CARP is going to demand regulations and standards for all long-term care facilities, standards and regulations that are monitored and enforced. Without monitoring, without enforcement, it's not going to happen. And if it's properly monitored and enforced, then it won't matter who's running it if it's being run properly. You know, the mandate letter that the uh, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau sent to the uh, Minister of Seniors and the Minister of Health said that they would sh should work together to make sure that seniors get the best possible support. Well, CARP's going to hold their feet to the fire on that one. Long-term care, as we said, needs to be completely rebuilt from the ground up. We expect to see improvement in staffing levels, in infection control training, in access to personal protective equipment, and the condition of those aging and outdated facilities. Well, let's move on though to, to uh, home care and community care. Uh, we will, as I said, continue to uh, ha show concern for long-term care, but we really believe the true answer is in better home care and community care. Remember, only five to 8% of older Canadians live in long-term care. The other 90 to 95 percent live in their own family homes and apartments, condos, senior residences. And across Canada, and even within individual provinces, there are gross inequities in services, facilities, and even the common definitions of how we work. As I said, we only spend half as much on long-term care as other comparable countries, and we only spend uh, as 10% of long-term care budgets on home and community care. 95% of the, the older adults live in the community. Only 10% of the money is spent on their, their care. That has to change. Home and community care is underutilized and poorly funded. And home care services, you know, aren't publicly insured to the Canada Health Act in the same way that an inpatient hospital and physician services are. So no wonder they get the short end of the stick. In Canada, most home and community care services are delivered by provincial, territorial, and even municipal governments. And a large portion are family funded, funded by our families ourselves. In 2017, the federal government designated $6 billion over 10 years to invest in more home and community care. We're asking what happened to those dollars. Both the federal uh, ministers of health and seniors were told that they should do something about it. CARP will be watching, commenting and demanding action, not promises. We're tired of promises. We want action. The pandemic has shown that home care and community care uh, based solutions are critical and CARP asked the federal government to financially support tied to national standards the, the, the need to meet those critical needs. They had but their money has to be accompanied by national standards and we're tired of the excuse. Well, that's a provincial area. In, in the next year, CARP will push for more funding for frontline home care better community care and respite care, increased nursing hours, expanded telecare solutions where they're appropriate, and the understanding that telecare is not appropriate for all seniors, and providing tax income rebates for family caregivers, an area that's been ignored much too long. 
the standard of level of uh, standard and level of care across our countries shouldn't be determined by our postal code or our ability to pay. All Canadians need home and community or facility care and should, they should all benefit from the same high quality of service. As I pointed out in Canada, we only spend about 10% of the long ter term care budget on home and community care, yet 90 to 95% of those of our seniors are, are at home. That's just wrong. Human uh, home and community care services are underutilized, poorly funded, and difficult to access. One of the issues is that home and community care services aren't insured like those hospital and physician services. Family funded home care should receive a tax credit in recognition of the cost that families face uh, to assure the security of their loved ones. And that saves the government money too. So Canada's are, are, Canadians are expecting and CARP will continue uh, to uh, fight for all those changes. CARP's next focus will be on the financial security of older adults. You know, despite the health concerns, when we do our surveys of CARP uh, members and other old adults across Canada, one of the very top issues all the time and sometimes even before healthcare is their worries about their financial future. The COVID pandemic has increased the financial anxiety of many of our members as they see their expenses rise against their fixed incomes. Many CARP members fear that their, the economic disruption is going to put their retirement savings at risk. As a COVID relief, seniors received an OAS top up of $300 for those eligible and uh, those who were particularly, had particularly less income got another 200. $500 in total for some, 300 for most. Other segments of the community received thousands of dollars. Patently unfair. CARP will hold the government, the federal government to its election promises of boosting the old age pension by 10% for people 75 years of age and older and increasing the Canada Pension Plan survivor benefit by 25%. We want the elimination of the mandatory uh, uh, retirement withdrawals uh, so seniors don't need to deplete their rest eggs and nest eggs before they need to do it. We want uh, legislation that better protects senior investors. We want a full tax benefit for people on the CPP disability pension and we want safeguards for pensioners when companies go bankrupt. Surely that's very little to ask on behalf of those who have contributed so much to the, to the country, yet see their finances dwindling even more so, so during COVID. Older Canadians are one of the most financially vulnerable populations in Canada, especially those who live alone. Pensions have to be protected, we have to close the loopholes that allow company pensions to be reduced or eliminated due to bankruptcy. The next area we're going to concentrate on is older adult fitness. As you'll see, Moses reminded us in, in his uh, written report, which I hope you've all read, uh, we CARP members have a personal responsibility for our own health. Usually we're advocating to others. In this case, we're advocating to ourselves. Moses' call was for us to stand up or sit up straight, move our buns and preserve our minds. Well, that's more important than ever before. You know, if we could be assured of one pill, one medication that we could take to add years to our lives, wouldn't most of us take that medication? Well, there is such a pill that'll add years to our lives. And that's looking after our own health and especially our own fitness. And we have to take our own responsibility to do that. Now CARP wants the government to invest in ways to help us uh, do that. Uh, the fe federal seniors tax credit was canceled back in 2017. Uh, CARP wants public health dollars focused on older adult fitness, like a fitness activity tax credit. 
and local recreation departments need to focus more on older adults and not realize they're not just there to offer hockey and baseball to the kids in the community. What we need is a federal government seniors fitness action plan. And here at CARP, we're going to take our own action. We're going to re-energize re and facilitate our peer support walking program through our chapters. Walking with or without poles, for you who know, know, those who know me, walking with or without Nordic style poles is one of the best fitness activities for any older, older adult. Well, I've talked about four of our fitness advocacy priorities for 2021, but we will continue to hold a watching brief on a number of other areas. And in your own province and in your own local community, uh, we know you will find issues that have to be addressed to prevent the creeping ageism that we're witnessing across the country propelled by COVID-19. We'll continue to fight the creeping reemergence of age, ageism and return to our priorities of, tw of last year at this time, the Fix Healthcare campaign. We'll advocate for better education, support, and management of areas like the best available vaccines, such as the high dose uh, flu vaccine that provide best in class evidence-based resources that provide quality information for both older adults and caregivers to help them better understand the benefits of vaccinations of all kinds as a part of uh, good preventative health. We'll be, we'll be continuing to educate and call for better access to medical cannabis and have us all understand how medical cannabis can help uh, us as we grow older. We want to look again at the, the areas of eye care, oral health, and hearing care, all areas that seem undervalued by our system, but, but uh, pro proper oral health, mouth care, uh, being able to see properly, be able to hear properly, are huge issues with seniors that seem to be ignored more and more across the country. And seniors' mental health has really been impacted by uh, uh, COVID. We need much more attention to seniors' mental health. We're seeing uh, many more dollars going to uh, youth mental health, and that is certainly important. But in doing so, we seem to forget how the impact of COVID and, uh, and the impact of isolation has created mental health problems among our seniors. And of course, we want equitable access across the country to the best phar pharmaceuticals. Uh, a national pharmaceutical program, national pharmacare. We're not saying we're not looking for the cheapest program. We're looking for the best program that will service all Canadians and especially our older adult CARP members. Well, I firmly believe that the effectiveness of uh, CARP advocacy in the next year. Uh, will be enhanced by the energy of our staff, the dedication of our volunteers, and the active support of our now 325,000 members. So I urge you to invite your family and your friends to join us to make CARP's new vision of aging the better future for Canada's older Canadians. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill and, and Mr. Singh. Thank you for for uh, tuning in to, to hear CARP's plans for 2021 and our advocacy. We do want to take some questions uh, from Mr. Singh and, or Bill. And, and if I could ask any members of the board or our chapter volunteers from across the country who are on our screen, if they wanted to raise their hand first to ask a question, and then we will look into the chat where we've had dozens and dozens of great questions from participants. And right now we're looking at over 600 people on the line right now. So thank you to everyone for joining us and we'll start with questions now. Uh, Rick, did I see you put your hand up? Rick Baker in Ottawa. Yes, Thanks, sir. Rick, Rick Baker is the chair of our Ottawa CARP chapter. Mr. Singh, I really want to uh, thank you for showing up today. I think it's very critical. Um, in your particular role, your party holds the balance of power. 
do you predict that there will probably be a federal election this year based on all the non-compliance of uh, what you say happens with the Liberal Party, but even more so in terms of what's happening with Conservative government? Thank you, Mr. Baker, for the question. Uh, and just a clarification, should I take each question one at a time? Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Baker, again. Yeah, so I want to be very clear on this point. What we saw, and I'm sure some folks might have noticed this, uh, before the new year, in around uh, November, December time, there was a, a conf there was a uh, opposition day motion brought forward. And uh, that is a normal thing. Opposition emotions are brought forward. But what was very uh, unique and not normal was that uh, the Liberals and Justin Trudeau deemed that the vote on the opposition day motion would be a confidence vote, which is very, I don't think that's ever happened in the history of minority governments in Canada. Doing that made it very clear that Justin Trudeau was looking for an excuse to go to, to an election. I felt that it is a wrong thing to do in the middle of a pandemic when people need help and support, we need to procure the vaccine and deliver the vaccine. I voted against going to an election. I did not want to give Justin Trudeau an excuse to go to an election when that's what he was looking for and he wanted to blame the opposition. We've been able to fight and secure some really massive wins for people throughout the pandemic and we want to continue to use our position in this minority government to do that. So I will continue to say that this is not the time to go to an election, that Justin Trudeau should focus every bit of his effort on securing the vaccine and on delivering the vaccine. That really should be the primary focus right now. Uh, but it does look like that, that instead of doing that, instead of focusing on the vaccine, he is gearing up for an election. There's been comments made to his uh, national, the national party had to be ready for an election. And he's been dropping various signals that that is what uh, he's intending. If he does so, he will have to do so on his own. I will not be contributing to any excuse to go to an election, but that does look like what he's doing. In case folks are wondering though, we are in a great position to fight an election. We've paid off our previous 2019 and in fact our 2015 debt. Uh, we've got money in the bank. We're ready to fight an election, but I don't want to do that. I don't think it's the right thing to do right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Singh and thank you, Rick. Ramona or Bill? Uh, did you have a question from the board? Um, it's Ramona Captain here, uh, White Rock, Surrey in British Columbia. I've noticed that in the, uh, the chat box and in the, the Q&A, a lot of people are asking about, um, you know, what CARP stand is. And uh, I think Bill pointed out very clearly what, what we're doing in the following year. But for those who would like to see exactly, please go to www.carp.ca and all our advocacy issues are there, plus everything that CARP does for members. There's also great benefits. And uh, one person asked in the, in the Q&A, why should I join CARP again? And uh, my, my reply to that is, the more voices we have, we can go to our NDP leader like uh, Jagmeet Singh, and we can go to all levels of government with a, a loud, clear voice, and it's membership that does that. So please don't drop your membership. It's very, very important. That way we all have a voice. Thank you. Thank you, Ramona. Fred Harwood from the Richmond Delta CARP chapter had his hand up for a question. Thank you. Uh, I would like to raise a question from Janice Daly in the chat. I thought it was very appropriate. She's asking about dental care as a neglect of dental care creates more serious health problems. And especially during COVID where we've got so many people afraid to go out. Her question then is uh, around why is there not more emphasis on preventative care in Canada? Mr. Harwood, thank you so much for the question. Uh, I appreciate that and I absolutely agree. Uh, even Pharmacare, if you look at Pharmacare, one of the big arguments for it is that people who are diagnosed with an illness and then can't afford to take the medication or think about taking less dose or cutting pills in half, all of which happen, I'm sure you know of stories where this is going on, uh, by not taking the medication they need, people then get more and more sick, more and more ill, and end up in the worst stages of an illness. And as we all know, the worst stage of any illness is more costly to cure. 
and it's harder on the person, of course, individually, but harder on the healthcare system. So it's pro it's preventative to take medication. And dental care is absolutely connected to our overall well being. If, if you can't eat well, we know nutrition is so vital to, to health and to well being. And if your teeth are hurt, your teeth have issues, uh, there is no there is no path for someone to get dental care. You could go in to a hospital with pain in your teeth and get painkillers, but not actually get treatment. And that that really makes no sense. So I absolutely believe as an approach, dental care, pharmacare, these are preventive, these are proactive ways to prevent further illnesses. But we also need to look at uh, as the your your chair of policy men, uh, indicated, Mr. Van Gorder. Um, investing in making it easier to, to exercise and be physically active, though it's sure there is a personal responsibility, but we also have a, a way to encourage the, I've heard this saying that if you make the healthy choice, the easier choice, people will take it every day. And so we need to make the healthy choice, the easier choice. It's easy to get active. It's easy to go to a community center and find programs to be active. And so right now the easy, the healthy choice is not always the easiest choice. And so uh, for many reasons, I absolutely agree in preventative measures, investing in healthcare to keep people well. It shouldn't just be about uh, curing an illness. It should be about making sure people are healthy to begin with. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Uh, Mr. Van Gorder mentioned in his presentation that the important thing for CARP in the face of long-term care was that the whoever is providing the, the care do it properly. And we have a question from a member named Julie, and she asks if there's not-for-profit long-term care, then who will be running these current private long-term care sites? How do we transition, in your party's view, from a shared model to a excuse me, public-only model? Right, and, and I should note, it, I should note uh, what we want to do specifically is remove the for-profit, but there are many great not-for-profit uh, run long-term care homes. Uh, when the goal is not profit, so not-for-profit or public, then we've seen the evidence has shown that more of the investments or all the investments go towards the care. One of our big concerns is if we're spending, and someone mentioned this in the chat as well, if we give $1 to long-term care and it's a pro for-profit home, well, there's a portion of that that's not gonna go to senior care, it's gonna go to profits, it's an extra margin. And that's a problem. But I, I take uh, Mr. Van Gorder's point very well, no matter what happens, we need to make sure that there are standards of care that are being met. And that includes standards of hours of care, levels of staffing. And in terms of who governs it, uh, we are faced with a similar problem to when we brought in universal health care. At that time, of course, it's a provincial jurisdiction, but it was federal leadership that helped us get to a point where we had universal, universal health care. Tommy Douglas's vision, the New Democrat vision of making sure everyone had health care was something that the Canada Health Act contributed to, a number of steps contributed to, and we had private hospitals that we had to contend with and we wanted to remove. And so the Canada Health Act was instrumental in getting rid of them. At the end of the day, when it comes to healthcare, uh, my value is people should be put first, our seniors should be put first, and any way we can possibly achieve that is, is our goal. We are a strike a task force to look at the various ways where we can increase funding for public delivery or not-for-profit delivery of that long-term care. Thank you. Bill, I saw you, uh, I think you were gonna open your microphone there, Bill. Did you have a follow-up question for Mr. Singh? No, sir. All right, then I look to Ron Swan. He is the, the chair of our CARP Nova Scotia chapter. A question from the Atlantic provinces. I, uh, I just like to say that uh, CARP, uh, CARP Nova Scotia, uh, our health advocacy committee is working currently on a position paper in home care in this province. And uh, we've got some very, very well qualified individuals uh, working on that paper and uh, uh, that have been involved in home care, both in delivery and lived experience with uh, taking care of parents that, uh, that are currently at home and now in long-term care and so forth. So I, I just wanted to, uh, on behalf of Nova Scotia, advocate uh, as to how important that is not just here in Nova Scotia, but right across the country. To the moderator, I do wanted to add one point. I, one of your members, I believe it was Ms. Uh, Captain, uh, mentioned the importance of joining CARP. Uh, as much as I, I, I'll, I'll tell you this from the perspective of a leader, one of the powers of CARP is the membership. Uh, and I, maybe I should, I'm stepping out of line to advocate for you, but 
uh, having a large membership is it does have a lot of weight. And and uh, anyone who is a in any way smart politician will acknowledge the the power of that membership, and and wanting to speak and wanting to hear speak with you and hear your concerns. It is actually very convincing, and uh, there are power in numbers. So I just wanted to mention that that was a very powerful point brought up. And and there might be a time when I'm prime minister that CARP will have a, a concern with me. Uh, and me advocating for more membership might turn back on me, but I think that's right. I think if you have a concern, you should bring it up to me and I should be able to answer and be able to respond. So there is power in numbers. Just wanted to add that in. Thank you so very much. <laughs> thank, thank you. We'll, we'll note that when when Mr. Trudeau was the leader of the third party, he attended a CARP AGM and he went on to become the prime minister in the following election. So thank you for attending our AGM and perhaps you'll have the similar similar outcome. I wanted to, uh, just to nod to Moses, was there something Moses that you wanted to add about the, the membership and the voice and the role that we play in, in making these political changes? Sorry, Moses, still on mute. There we are. Here we go, it never fails. Um, I was, I was, in the process of saying that I was very glad to have the uh, question of membership brought up because we do get lost sometimes. In we have and, and we thank Jagmeet very much for uh, endorsing that idea that uh, we, we have uh, a right to uh, place in high priority the task of growing our numbers. And, uh, and we're going to try and live up to that command, Jagmeet. Thanks again. I'll be calling when you're prime minister. Look forward to it. <laughs> I believe we have reached the, the allotted time for Mr. Singh's participation. Uh, perhaps I'll ask uh, Mr. Van Gorder just, just to thank him and to let Mr. Singh know we'll share every question that we've received in our Q&A. We'll be answering the CARP portion and we'll, we'll share the questions directly with you that we didn't get to. Uh, based on your remarks, and we'll we'll encourage you to respond to them, and we'll post them on our website. So over to you, Mr. Van Gorder. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Singh. And as as both uh, Moses and Anthony have said, we very much appreciate you being with us today. The frankness of your comments and your willingness to uh, answer questions, and I can assure you that uh, we will continue to be in touch with you, and uh, we'll make sure you and your staff are aware of all the details of our our advocacy requests and the and the backup and data that we uh, have and. Hope Hope that we can continue to look to your support and uh, and also I want to uh, as I believe I said to you when we spoke uh, last fall I am very much impressed by your knowledge of our uh, of our con concerns and appreciate the fact that uh, uh, you do seem to understand uh, what uh, older adults are feeling across Canada and just hope you're able to across uh, those barriers, especially that terrible barrier between uh, federal and provincial governments that leaves us caught in the middle that has to be broken down so people get the health care they deserve no matter where they live. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate the, I was going to mention something about the questions. I wanted to respond to them. So I'm very thankful that you'll send those my way. And it's my honor to be able to speak with uh, my elders and uh, people that we should respect and care for. And I will commit to doing my best to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I see lots of applause on there. Thank you very much, Mr. Singh.